it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. People wash up on the shore of my island community. It's my duty to kill them before they wake up. Have you ever just sat on a beach, watching the waves crashing into the shore and retreating back out to the sea? Have you ever noticed driftwood or shells being dragged back out, not knowing where they would end up next? Every morning I sit here, looking out into the ocean where the grey sky meets the dark water on the horizon. I wait. Wait to see one of them wash in with the tide, drifting up onto the hard-packed sand. As soon as I see them, I run from my position, grabbing them and dragging their limp bodies further up the beach, laying them to rest in the soft sand near the brush-filled dunes. And that's when I set to work. It's a ritual I've performed since I was a child, being trained by my father just like his father did for him. I look down at the naked body, always different, sometimes a man, sometimes a woman, ranging from a younger adult to decrepit and old. Some have been thin, some obese. Once the drifter was missing a leg, making the ritual difficult to perform in its entirety. I make do though. I lay them on their backs, feet facing land and head to the water, their arms stretched out to their sides in a crucifix position. I know I have to work quickly, before they wake up. I've never had the misfortune of seeing it before, but I've been told the stories of what happens if they wake before the ritual's complete. The entire island could be erased in the blink of an eye. Generations of work, my bloodline, all for naught. Oh, I'm getting distracted, sorry. Yeah, the ritual. While in the crucifix position, I start the runes. Beginning with each hand and foot, I carve the same sequence going inward towards the body, from the tips of the fingers and toes, moving counterclockwise from the left hand to the feet, and finishing with the right hand. The work is methodical. My knife moves with a determined precision, honed with twenty years of practice. Their blood flows blue, staining the sands with an almost neon hue. A scent of ammonia lingers with it. When every limb has been carved, I start at the top of their head, moving from the small bump in the middle of their forehead down toward the chest. They bleed much more when I get to the neck, as one of the runes must cut right across the jugular. Their blood sprays, leaving a shower on the surrounding sand. Some days it mixes with a drizzle of rain, creating a bluish mist that floats across the beach. And finally, the runes are finished. The ritual is almost complete. I lay my knife down and wipe my hand across the drifter's throat, making sure I have enough blood to finish. I swipe their blood across my own forehead, leaving a horizontal line above my eyes, then drawing a vertical line under each of my eyes. This is my war paint. I alone stand against these terrors, protecting my island community, and by extension, the world. The preparations are done. I pick up the knife once more and walk to meet the crashing waves. The final step. My hand dips under the salt water, opening with my palm up. The waves crash in, and as soon as they begin to be pulled back to the sea, I swipe the knife across, letting my own blood flow freely and mix with the water. This is the final offering the plea to whatever gods rule over the sea to end this monstrosity and keep us safe. The salt water stings as I bring my hand back up, the cold air adding to the pain. My feet slide across the sand as I walk back to the drifter, lifting the knife, still dripping with a mix of my blood and salt water. I plunge it into the middle of the drifter's chest, into the diaphragm. The same reaction every time. Their eyes snap open, a final desperate gasp for air, all in vain. I've severed the muscle that allows them to draw breath. They slowly drown, 
as whatever blood is left in them fills their lungs, screaming curses in a language I don't understand. When the ritual's done, and the last spasms go through their bodies, I grab the can of gasoline and the herbs I keep in a small shack on the beach. I douse the body, setting it alight and throwing the herbs on top. Like sage for cleansing spirits, the bundle of lavender and catnip smoulders, sending wisps of their scent through the air. With this, the drifter is cleansed and the island safe once more. I head back to the village, taking the beaten path carved into the brush by the generations before me. I exchange nice pleasantries with others as I pass by. They thank me for what I do, protecting us from the drifters. I simply nod, telling them it's my duty, nothing more. I make my way to the village square, heading into the courthouse at the other end. Briggs, our mayor, is waiting for my daily report. He looks up from the papers he's signing as I walk into the room. Rally, how are you today? Any happenings at the shore? He shuffles the papers aside and leans back in his seat, motioning to the chair across from him. I sit down in the stiff leather chair, hearing it squeak under me. There was one, older, male. They're coming more often these days. This is the third this week. When I started twenty years ago, we got one every two weeks or so. Should I be worried, sir? His brow furrowed with worry. He was an older man, at least sixty. He'd lived on the mainland for a while before coming back to the island in his younger years world-weary and in disbelief at what we had to worry about compared to the outside world. They knew nothing of the drifters, the dangers they posed to our world, the heretic god they served. We'll uh, certainly need to keep an eye on it. The records show that more show up preceding times of trouble. The earliest we have on record preceded the Black Plague. There are an average of two drifters per day, with the highest number being five washing up at once. Your post was manned by five watchers around the clock, making sure none went uncleansed. Uh, we must be vigilant. Make sure this doesn't become a problem like then. Do you think there could be something terrible on the horizon? I asked. I was the only one trained in the ritual. My father had to help me when he was my age, and his father and brothers before him, but... I was alone. I had taken no wife, had no living children, and my only brother was killed as a child. If they began washing up more often, I was the only defence. As of yet, there's no way to tell. We must simply pay attention. Find someone from the village that shows promise. Take them to be trained. You may need help, he answered, waving me off. I got up to walk out. Rally. I turned back, giving him a questioning look. He dug around in his desk drawer before withdrawing a long, thin blade in a black scabbard. He pulled the blade out of the sheath by a few inches, showing me a startlingly pristine edge with the runes I use inscribed on it. He sheathed it again and handed it over to me. This has been handed down from elder to elder. If the time comes when there are too many, use this. It allows the ritual to be bypassed. I bowed and thanked him as I took the sabre. In all my research and learning about my position, I'd never heard of this. We'd always been told the ritual was the only way. I headed out and back to my house, lost in thought as I walked. I was shaken from my daydreaming by screaming coming from down the path, in the direction of the shore. Rally! Rally! Vale, one of the village teenagers. She was shouting for me in a panicked voice, fear rising to overtake any other emotion. Quick! You have to go to the shore! What's going on? I stopped her as she ran up, panting for breath. She leaned over and grabbed her knees, gasping. Another one! A drifter! Some of the kids were playing in the water and it washed up! She wheezed. Shit! I didn't even wait for her to finish. When she said drifter, I took off, sprinting with all the energy I had. I 
They're never washed up past noon. Rarely even after daybreak, even. Two in one day. This is bad. If one wakes up while I'm not there, ruin would follow. Thankfully, it wasn't far to the shore. As I passed over the dunes, I saw the children gathered around it. The drifter this time appeared to be a woman, old and covered in wrinkles. One of the children had a stick of driftwood they were using to poke at it, nudging it as the waves lapped around. Stop! I shouted, waving my arms as the children continued poking. They looked toward me, a quizzical glint in their eyes. <laughs> Get the fuck away from it! And it happened in slow motion. The drifter's eyes opened. Their unearthly green hue, like emeralds reflecting a blue sea, shone through the haze. I saw the sharp teeth bare themselves and the hands reach for the nearest child. Long claws tore skin and red blood mixed with the ocean spray. I heard the boy scream in pain before turning to a low gurgle as blood filled his throat instead. I wasn't thinking. Instinct took over and I drew the blade I'd just been given. The runes reflected the grey sky, the sharp edge of the blade shining like the sea. I jumped at the drifter and plunged the blade between its neck and shoulder, stabbing downward through the chest and into the gut. It let out a high screech and the wind around picked up intense howling echoing the drifter's cry. The ocean churned in response, seafoam churning into madness where calm small waves were before. Fucking die, I screamed. I plunged my hand down into the wound, covering it in blood and painting my face with it. I withdrew the sword, quickly slicing my palm and dipping it into the incoming wave. The drifter screamed again. Clouds moved in, raising any light that was left. The weather turned from a grey morning to a small hurricane in a matter of moments. I knew this had to end quickly. In one deft movement, I stabbed upward, bringing the blade out of the water and impaling the creature, right on target. And the screams died out, along with the wind. Peace had returned to the shoreline. I sat there for a moment, collecting myself, before turning to look at the gore mixed with the ocean. Oh, the poor boy. His throat torn out, had passed. I took him in my arms and carried him up to dry sand before going back and gathering the drifter's body. I covered the boy with my coat and the creature with gasoline. I wanted it to feel the flames of hell. I sat and watched it burn for a while. Long after... The local doctor had come and taken the boy, his mother screaming in grief as she watched. I couldn't come up with words to say I was sorry. I was supposed to protect these people. I was the one that should be dead. When the last ashes had fizzled out, I still remained, thinking to myself what could be done to prevent this from happening again. Little did I know that it would only get worse from there. Part 2 They're appearing more often. There were two more this morning. I was waiting, watching the sea thrash and roll. I'm not sure when I drifted off. The same nightmare that kept me up the night before covered me again, leaving me in fits. I saw the boy's corpse laying in the way blood being pulled out with the sea foam. Suddenly the clouds started rolling in, wind whipping up sand and spray. I saw lightning flash down the shoreline and felt the thunder boom in my chest immediately after. Something was coming. The waves grew taller with each one that crashed ashore. When I looked closer, I saw that it wasn't just water hitting the shore. Oh, drifters. Hundreds of them all tangled into each other in the waves, piling on top of each other as they hit the shore. Levees made of bodies started to block the waves. Suddenly, the sky opened above me. The wind stopped, the ocean calmed. The drifters lay in their piles, sleeping like the dead. 
the eye of the storm. Just as soon as it started, it was over. A million eyes snapped open at once. Their screams layered each other, creating an unholy chorus as they woke and began flooding inland. Right before the flood, I caught a glimpse of the horizon. Great clouds mired above rolling waves. Through the wind and rain, I could see something moving against the sky, wading through the depths of the water towards my home. I'd seen pictures of skyscrapers, and this dwarfed them. Just as it began to become clear through the sheets of rain, a bolt of lightning struck in front of it. And I woke with a start, jumping from the sand and looking in the direction it had been. The flood was gone. The day was grey, but still, just a dream. I shook the sleep from my eyes and resumed my vigil. I spotted one washing in with the waves. Male, middle-aged. Other than the bump in the middle of their forehead and the long claw-like nails, he could have passed for a normal islander. I set to work and was almost done with the carving when I heard a voice from behind me. There's another one. I looked up, startled. Nobody else came out here this early. After what happened, I didn't think anyone would ever come here again. I was surprised even more to see that it was Vale, now nodding towards the shore a ways to my left. I followed her gaze and saw another motionless form crumpled there, sea foam washing over. Oh, damn it all, I muttered. Time to kill two birds with one stone. I left the one I was working on and walked over to the new arrival. Before grabbing this one, I dunked my hand into the water and sliced my palm, completing this part of the ritual ahead of time. As I began to drag the body back towards the first drifter, Vale ran up and grabbed the other arm, helping me along. It wasn't your fault, you know, she said, grunting with exertion. I was nearby when they found it. I should have told them to get away before I came to get you. I didn't even think they'd do something like that. Don't blame yourself, I replied, letting go of the new drifter and kneeling down next to the first. I took out my knife and plunged it into the diaphragm. The piercing scream began, then died out quickly. The new drifter didn't stir. If they're showing up more often, you're going to need help, she said again, still watching as I doused the first one and struck a match. Teach me. I can handle it. I didn't answer her, but threw the match down and started carving the new drifter. Small sizzles could be heard as ocean spray and light rain hit the burning body. I could still feel Vale's eyes on me, intently watching my hands work the knife through skin, carving my legacy in a living canvas. When the runes were done, I beckoned for her to follow me to the water. She stood beside me as waves lapped over our feet. I looked out of the grey sky and rolling sea, remembering the moment my father brought me out here how he'd carve the runes, then walk me out to the water. Have you ever lost someone, Vale? I asked her. She seemed taken aback by the question at first, and then looked down at the water as she pondered it. You knew my mother, she said. You know I lost her. You didn't know your mother. She died giving birth to you. Have you ever lost anyone you truly knew and loved? I shot back. Then, um, no, I guess I haven't. I sighed and unholstered my knife, turning toward her. If you take this on, you will lose someone you love. Maybe more than one. That's what we give up in order to protect the island. Are you prepared to take that on? She seemed scared. Couldn't really blame her. She'd seen the aftermath of what happened yesterday. She knew what we'd be dealing with. But underneath the fear, there was desperation. Desperation to prove her strength and protect others. I am, she finally answered after staring out at the foaming waves. What do I have to do? You're not of my bloodline, but there are certain cases where others can be allowed in to take over. I looked down at my hand, the cut already clotted with blood. 
I swept the knife across to reopen it. Come, we have to go further out. When we were waist deep in the water, I handed her the knife. Now, cut your palm and hold it open, I said. She winced as the sharp edge of steel sliced her hand. The blood flowed quickly, dripping into the water and leaving a red cloud. I held my hand above hers, making a fist and squeezing so a trickle of blood fell onto her cut. I then opened my own palm, placing it flat on hers so our cuts aligned, and took her hand under the water. She drew a deep breath in through her teeth as the salt water hit the open flesh, but composed herself quickly. I, Rally Karras, do hereby pass my bloodline onto Vale Jensen. Having no living children and having taken no wife, I realize that any day my bloodline may die and our cleansing end. Vale has offered herself as a tribute to the ocean, pledging to protect the island and all inhabiting it from the drifters and the heretical gods they serve. Do you accept this duty, Vale? Yes, she replied. I motioned for her to walk further into the water, letting go of her hand. She looked at me, asking, How far? Until the sea takes you, I replied. She nodded, walking further. At about ten meters out, she was completely engulfed, going under the water. She came up moments later, walking back to my position. Her usually wild, curly hair was now limp and soaked around her shoulders. She shone with a new purpose as she rejoined me. You are aware that, with this acceptance, you may never leave the island, being the first and last defense against the unknown. You know that the ocean requires a heavy toll for your service and the power bestowed upon you. Do you still accept? I hoped she'd say no, but knew in my heart she couldn't. It was the same feeling I had thinking back to when I took the oath my father standing in my place. Once you had the notion to take on this duty, it never left you. Yes, she said again. Vale Jensen, by my power and authority, being the last remaining of my bloodline, I surrender you to the sea. Today you are born anew in the salt and brine of the ocean. I withdrew my hand from the water, turning my fingers down so the mix of salt water and blood coated my fingertips. I drew the rune of rebirth on her face, a clockwise spiral ending in a smaller spiral spinning counterclockwise from the center, the ever-flowing dichotomy of life and the sea. I swear to serve with my life, she replied, giving a small bow. We'll start your training tomorrow, I told her. For now, I will finish this ritual. You will walk back to the village and stand in the square until I return. Tell anyone that asks that you are now my apprentice. Yes, sir, she said, walking back up the beach. I sighed as she left, taking myself back up to where the newest drifter lay on the sand. I kneeled next to it, hefting my knife once more. I placed it above the diaphragm, one hand holding it steady while the other was poised above it, ready to thrust downward. I bowed my head, closing my eyes and whispering a prayer. Protect her. Let me be the father to her I could never be to my own daughter, I muttered. My hand raised up, tensing at the expectation of pain when it hit the knife handle. I was more surprised to feel the hand on my wrist as it moved downward. My eyes snapped open to see the drifter grabbing on, holding my hand back. Our numbers are infinite, it said. We serve and we will be rewarded. We will devour you, drown you in the blood of your loved ones. We are as vast as the ocean and relentless as the waves. We will break you. The pure hatred in its eyes terrified me. I'd never seen anything like it. The pure, dripping spite. It bore through my skin and into my soul. It despised me, 
and that cold, unfeeling stare almost seemed to freeze the entire world. I forced myself to move as it opened its mouth wide to scream, making the wind pick up and clouds go dim. My other hand plunged the knife in. Its screams turned to wet gurgles as it drowned, choking on blood. I fell back in the sand, shaking. After what seemed like eternity, I pulled the knife from its chest and got the gas cannon herbs, beginning the final step of cleansing. I didn't stay to make sure the fire was put out, but instead rushed back up the path to the village, stopping at the first person I saw. Hello, Rally. Anything I can do for you? He said. I didn't remember his name, but recognized him from the butcher shop in town. I need you to go to the shore and keep watch. If any wash up, come and get me. I'll be speaking to Briggs in his office. He looked at me quizzically, not quite understanding why I would want an untrained person watching the shore. Well, I ended up losing my temper. Just fucking go. He tore up the path, leaving a dust cloud behind him. I rushed into the square, grabbing Vale who was standing in the middle, chatting with some of the village women who were congratulating her. We barged into the office to Briggs' surprise. Rally, you didn't tell me you'd chosen an apprentice already. I should have had the final approach. I cut him off before he finished. What the fuck is happening, Briggs? I shouted, causing both him and Vale to wince in return. One of those damn things grabbed me and spoke. They have never spoken before. His eyes grew wide. I could see Vale bring a hand to her mouth next to me. Briggs sat back in his chair, reaching into a drawer and pulling out a tall bottle filled with dark amber. He produced three glasses from the same drawer and started pouring. I'm sorry for overstepping your authority, he said, raising the glass to his lips and sloshing half of it down his shirt from shaking hands. I'd hoped this wouldn't happen while I was in charge. Uh, I guess I hoped for too much. He drained the glass, then got up and walked over to a portrait on the wall. Pulling the portrait up and setting it down on the floor, he revealed a safe behind it. He opened it and pulled out a large, leather-bound book, yellowed with age. The next item he revealed was an old flintlock pistol. Everything you'll need to know is in there, he said motioning to the book. I'm sorry, but this is just too much. And he raised the gun to his temple and cocked the hammer. I barely had time to grab Vale and avert her eyes when he pulled the trigger. Warm blood and sharp skull fragments sprayed over us. Part 3. Now I know where they come from. The past 24 hours have been a blur. I only remember walking Vale out into the square, both of us spattered with blood and grey matter. Everyone looking at us, some screaming, some crying. I sat Vale down on a bench and motioned for a nearby woman to come over. Take care of her. If she's not in shock yet, she soon will be, I said, and turned to walk back into the building. Also, call for the doctor. I'll need his help moving Briggs. The smell had already gotten bad inside. Copper. Sharp. It took me by surprise after dealing with the ammonia-tinged blood of the drifters for so long. I looked down at Briggs' body. Small wisps of steam rising from the open wound as cold air drifted in. Cowardly bastard. I muttered to his body. Probably for the first time since my father had brought me out to the beach. I was scared. I'd seen the soul drain from Briggs's face when I told him about the drift of speaking. He knew things I never did, things that he didn't want to face. But what? The book was still lying on the desk where he'd left it, now covered in a messy layer of gore. I grabbed a nearby cloth and wiped it clean, trying my best to get all the pieces of brain and skull off. Runes were emblazoned on the cover. Some of them I'd never seen before. I opened the book and began reading. 
The pages were old and yellowed, with spots here and there from where ink had been spilled and what I think was blood. There are illustrations of drifters, making detailed notes of their anatomy and physiological traits. The next page showed the rune configurations, as well as the carving for the ritual. I'd just begun to flip through to another when there was a knock on the door. Rally, what the hell happened here? Gareth, our local doctor, was standing in the doorway, a handkerchief held over his face. He gazed around the room in horror before settling on Briggs' body. Oh God, Briggs. You know anything about all this? I asked him, drawing his eyes to the book. He shook his head, looking instead at the flintlock pistol still clutched in Briggs' hand. So he did this to himself? Yeah. Told him about the drifter that just spoke while I was doing the ritual. He handed me this book, then blew his goddamn brains out. I haven't seen anyone that terrified since... Well... Your brother. Gareth finished my thought. Go, Rally. I'll take care of this. I know this brings back painful memories for you. He moved from the doorway, revealing that Vale was standing behind him, still with a look of shock on her face. I snatched the book off the desk and walked briskly out, grabbing her arm and turning her from the grisly scene. There were tear tracks through the blood on her face. We walked in silence towards her home. When we finally reached it, I sent her inside to clean up and sat on the porch to look further into the book. The first hour seemed to be all things I already knew about the ritual, the drifter's anatomy, a cipher of the runes. But then something caught my eye. It was another illustration, but this one of a human. Multiple drawings of the same person, but with subtle changes between each one. Initially, it was a lengthening of nails and teeth, small gills growing near the nape of the neck, then the eyes turning. I don't know what they used to capture the color of the eyes in the illustration, but it was hauntingly lifelike. The next page held notes and more illustrations. Large ships at sea during a storm, being rocked by the waves. A figure standing in the water, towering above them. Then the ships being torn asunder by the wind and surf. One survivor of cargo ship Fate's Rest, a man by the name of William Stedler, noted that before the ship sank he witnessed a looming giant on the horizon. I remembered my dream. The giant looming behind the waves of drifters. A general commanding his army. Stetler swears he saw this figure smash the ships with his own hands, causing all on board to fall into the water. Here he says that they were set upon by people that looked just like them, save for a small bump in their foreheads and elongated claws and teeth. Stetler says these figures would drag the surviving crew and passengers under the water, never to resurface. The book went on to explain how Stetler had survived. He was knocked out by a plank of wood hitting him in the water, and managed to wash up on the island, much like the drifters do. When the watchman on the shore at the time found him, he was almost cleansed with the ritual, only saved because his blood was red instead of blue. Safe to say this was a surprise for the watchman. Stedler joined the watch through marriage eventually, choosing to stay on the island instead of going back to his home on the mainland. He is responsible for one of the greatest breakthroughs in our understanding of the drifters. Ten years after the accident, and Statler was on duty keeping watch one morning. When a drifter washed in, he moved to retrieve it as he normally would, but was frozen with fear upon looking at the face. Vale walked back outside, looking at me with concern as she wrung water from her hair. What are we going to do? she asked, sitting down next to me. I didn't answer, still reading and rereading the same sentence. Stedler recognized his brother, Jacob Stedler, who he had last seen dragged under the surface ten years previous. He hadn't aged, and the only difference was the small bump on his head. Vale, I said, looking at her, there are things I'm still learning along with you. Things that may cause me to falter in the coming days and weeks. I need you to promise me that if I hesitate, you will step in and finish the job. 
I promise, Vale said, still looking concerned. What's going to happen, Riley? Just then someone came running up the path, shouting my name. I recognized the same man I'd stationed at the shoreline, out of breath and wild-eyed. Please, please come quick. He's going into the village. He stopped in front of the house, panting and shaking. Calm down. What the hell do you mean? I asked, jumping from my chair. And how did you know I was here? Uh, Doc Gareth told me we were taking Vale home. I saw, well, I saw Briggs. He almost looked like he was going to vomit when he said it, thinking of the mess in Briggs' office. A drifter washed up on shore. I saw it and started coming to get you, but, uh, well, he spoke to me. He asked where you were, Riley. Fucking hell, I said, beginning to gather my things and start back toward the village. He stopped me again before I could walk off. No, Rally, this one, it ain't like the others, he said, waving his hands frantically in front of him. It's him, Rally. I don't know how, but it's him. Who, goddammit? Who is it? Vale was shouting at him now, trying to make sense of this whole situation. River, the man whispered, looking down at the ground. I stopped dead in my tracks. I couldn't move. There was no way it could be him. He was gone, dead. His body was never found. This guy just didn't remember what he looked like. He was confused. Who the hell's River? Vale asked, getting impatient at the lack of answers. I turned to look at her grabbing the rune-inscribed blade from my bag in the process. I handed it over to her. You don't know the ritual yet, and I may not be able to see this one through, I said. Will anyone please tell me what's going on? I can't help when I'm in the dark here. Vale was practically screaming now, tearing at her hair. Who in the fuck is River? Why are you so worried about him? I felt tears forming in my eyes as I looked at her. Hot bile burned in my throat, and I almost choked on the words as they came up. River was my brother. Part 4. All Rivers Lead to the Ocean Silence smothered us as we walked back to the village square. I was beyond loss. It hit me when I read the book that something like this could be possible, but I didn't think it would happen this soon. Vale was certainly worried, shooting me looks of concern between looking down at the blade I'd given her. Finally, she spoke. What did you mean that he was your brother? What happened? I knew that she needed to know. Knew that she was only asking so she could be prepared. I resented it all the same. I had grieved River since the day I'd lost him, and it was only compounded by losing Dad days later. Did my dad know about this? Is that why... why he did what he did? It makes sense you don't remember it. You would have been very young. I finally replied, the words sounding as if they were coming from somewhere far away. River was out with Dad and I one day, keeping watch. He was playing in the water while Dad and I were patrolling. He was there one second, and gone the next. I don't know if it was a riptide or something else. He was just gone. So you never found his body? Vale whispered. I could feel the chill in her voice. She realized where this was going. That was twelve years ago, Vale. He was six years old. We never found him. There was a noticeable shakiness in my voice as I started to say what I feared. Dad, Dad blamed himself, or maybe he knew the truth. Either way, he killed himself that night. Walked right out to the beach, stood in the waves, and slashed his own throat. Dear God! Vale let out a small gasp. I found him the next morning. Tide was going out when he did it, so he didn't wash away. He was just laying there in a tide pool of his own blood. I... My voice cracked, remembering that day. I 
could still feel the cold rain stinging as it hit my skin, the wind scraping my face, sitting in the pool of his blood and shaking him, hoping he'd wake up. I just sat there until I saw a drifter wash up. Then I had a duty, something I was the only one fit for, only I could do until now. The village square was in sight now. I could see a crowd of people gathering around, all holding on to each other and staring at something in the middle. I stopped in the path, causing Vale almost to run into me. She hefted the blade in its sheath and looked at me expectantly as I turned to her. Remember what I told you. Step in if you falter. She nodded to me as she said it. If she was scared, she wasn't going to show it. Her grey eyes like the steel of the blade. She was well suited for this. If I make any sign of weakness, of not being able to do this, kill it, I said, reaffirming. If I can't promise emotion won't get the better of me, if I move to stop you, cut me down. Rally. She looked shocked at this, but the resolve returned moments later. Okay. We walked the remaining hundred yards or so into the square, the crowd parting as we came. As the last of them moved, I could see what they'd been staring at. A boy, no older than the day he'd disappeared, standing in the middle of the square. He had the signature bump of the drifters and pointed fingernails and teeth. Nothing had changed. He still had the short, cropped haircut that Dad had given him just days before he disappeared. I could see the small slits at his neck where gills had taken shape. He gave me a sharp smile as I approached. You grew up, he said. His voice was more guttural than I remembered. The innocence of a child's voice was gone, replaced by menace and bloodlust. I've missed you, big brother. River, I replied simply. I could feel hot tears stinging my eyes. I knew he was dangerous. He could rip me to pieces in seconds if I let my guard down. It didn't change the fact that he was my brother once. He still looked like that six-year-old boy that disappeared into the waves. You don't seem as happy as I thought you would. I was hoping for more of a reunion, he replied. He looked around at the crowd that was still looking on, staring at him in horror. What? I feel like you're all scared of me. What happened to you, River? I managed to choke out. I was showing weakness. No doubt he would try and take advantage of this. The ocean takes us all eventually, he replied. Some of us earlier than others. You and Dad didn't keep your eyes on me. And now here I am. I've come back for you, though. I wanted to show you all the wonderful things I've learned. All the amazing sights and feelings. They've taught me a lot in these few years I've been gone. Who? I asked. The others like me, of course. There are quite a few of us, as I'm sure you've noticed in the past few days. We've been busy recruiting, creating, swelling our ranks. We bring more to him and he makes them like us. I'm sure I can put in a good word for you all. River, this isn't you. I was talking more to myself at this point than him. I didn't want to believe this was what my brother had become. Didn't want to believe he could be this monster. You wouldn't know who I am, he roared, causing dark clouds to roll in and the wind to rise. I looked around, motioning everyone to stand back. I noticed then that Vale was no longer beside me. Please, brother, let's not do this. Come back to us. You don't have to be this way, I said to him, trying to look around for Vale without him noticing. I finally spotted her in the crowd of people, slowly moving her way through the masses, trying to flank River. I had to keep him distracted. There's no going back now. This island won't exist for much longer. All will be swallowed by the ocean soon enough. 
You'll join us or drown. Some of you have a choice. Some don't. He took a step forward, opening his arms toward me. I wanted to bring you with me, Raleigh. To extend an offer. I can bring you with me, and you can be made new. Quick. Painless. I want to help you, I continued. Vale was almost behind him. Just another minute, and she'd be in place. Oh, but I want to help you. River sneered back at me. Vale looked at me and nodded. Now, I lunged forward at the same moment she did. Her with the blade drawn, me with my knife. All I could see before striking was River's twisted smile. Vale struck just right, stabbing right into his spine. My knife found its mark in his throat, cutting any sound from him short. He managed to get two good swipes of his claws in, one striking veil across the face and leaving four long, jagged ravines of open flesh from her left eye down to her chin. The other hand managed to catch me in the stomach, knocking the wind from me and gouging into my flesh. I felt his hand tighten into a fist, closing around whatever internal organs he could. Get some rope, I shouted at the onlookers. Two of them ran toward the nearest building and found a halfway weaved fishing net that had been left there in the excitement of the day, throwing it to Vale and I. We quickly wrapped it around River, making sure he was bound right before cutting a strip of fabric from my sleeve and stuffing it into his mouth. There. No storms if he can't scream, I said, sitting back on the ground and clutching my stomach. I looked down to assess the damage and could see heavy bleeding as well as some of my insides where they shouldn't be. Gareth, where's Gareth? Vale ran to my side, taking off her coat and applying pressure to my stomach. Her eye was swollen shut at this point. She'd be very lucky to see out of it again. Vale, help him, please. I was gasping at this point. The adrenaline was wearing off and the pain taking over. The last thing I saw before passing out was Vale, tears mixing with the blood on her face, and River smiling at me on the ground. I'm awake again. It's been two days since we subdued River. Gareth patched me up the best he could, but the diagnosis is grim. River managed to do some damage while he was in there. Vale told me she has him locked away in Briggs' office. Says he's tied up in there, smiling at anyone who comes by. Half her face is covered in bandages. Gareth said her eye should heal, but she'll never regain 100% of her sight. I've been researching the book, she tells me. Says she's learned the runes and memorized the ritual. She said there's also some talk of an older ritual. One talked about from long ago by long gone ancestors. Something that may be able to stop all of this once and for all. That god, I guess you could call it, Vale says. The giant that creates them. There's a thought here and there by whoever put this together. They translated from some ancient notes left behind by the first inhabitants of our island. Whoever wrote this thinks that if two sacrifices are made, then he can be weakened and bound under sea. She went on explaining this further, but I was drifting in and out from pain. Eventually, Gareth came back in and gave me a new dose of medicine. Didn't do much for the pain, but at least it sedated me. I'm in and out now. Vale is working on figuring out this ritual. If she can crack it, we may just have a way to end all of this. I just hope I'll live to see it. Part 5. Finale Hell came to our island. Death came to our island. It was beginning to get dark outside. I was still recovering, hoping for the medicine that Gareth had given me to kick in soon so I didn't have to feel this throbbing pain nearly as much. I flipped through the book as I waited, the lamp beside me causing the pages to almost glow yellow. There were notes scribbled in the margins wherever they could fit, 
all in different handwriting. I had to wonder if these were written by cleansers before me. Oh, how old was this book? What happened to all of these people? If they'd had these notes and theories about the end, but still couldn't bring it about, was there something we weren't seeing in all of this? I flipped the page again and noticed there were no notes scribbled for the first time in at least a hundred pages. Instead, there was just one stanza of a poem, like a prophecy being laid out before me written in beautiful script. When the waves ride high in ocean's flood, rain and wind howl, filled with blood. Into the sea, brothers of red and blue, ending water's wrath, beginning days anew. Holy shit, I said under my breath. This was it. This was the answer. This was how to stop everything. Rally, rally, wake up. He stirred from the bed against the opposite wall, still in a drug stupor. Gavin had said his condition wasn't promising. When River had plunged his hand in, he'd severed quite a few of his intestines, causing massive internal bleeding. Gareth did as much as he could, but he wasn't outfitted for major surgery on this level. Riley turned to me, eyes barely open. Josephine, he mumbled, looking at me in surprise. Are you here to take me away? You've grown so much. No, Riley, it's me, Vale, I said. Gareth had told me he may hallucinate due to the medicine. I found it, Riley. I'm not ready, Josephine. He muttered back. Tears stung my eyes, seeing this man broken. He'd protected our island for so long, brought me under his wing without a question. I cried a little more as tears tracked their way across my still open wounds. There came a soft knock at the door as Gareth walked in, holding another vial of medicine and an armful of clean bandages. He looked at me as Riley muttered for Josephine once more. Poor man. He hasn't spoken about her in years, Gareth said. Who was Josephine? I asked him. He let out a sigh and sat next to the bed, beginning to dress Riley's wounds again. The only person he ever loved, Gareth replied. Josephine was his daughter. Where is she now? Whatever heaven you believe in. She only lived for an hour after birth. Passed away not long after her mother. He answered. That's why he took to you so well. You reminded him of what he'd lost. I couldn't hold it back any longer. Tears began to flow freely, stinging my wound even worse than before. I had no family. My mother died during childbirth. My father killed not long after my conception. The village had raised me, and Riley had always been there, offering advice or helping where he could. Now here he was, dying just a few feet away. Gareth finished wrapping the new bandages and stood up, handing me the vial. Give this to him when he wakes up. It'll help with the pain. He patted me on the shoulder as he began to walk out the door. Riley stirred. Gareth, he muttered. Gareth, I need to go. He turned back around, looking to Riley. Rest, old friend. We'll be safe until you're ready, he said. As he opened the door to step outside, a scream pierced the air. Rising wind followed it within seconds. Help! Help me, please! came a voice from somewhere outside. He began to scream again, but was cut off in a moment. Drag them to the waves, came another voice, this one guttural like the sound of rocks scraping against the ocean floor. Bring them to Pamphalassin, so he may shape them in his image. Oh, hell, Gareth said, stepping back inside and slamming the door. There's a horde of them out there. More screams cut through the air, causing the wind to strengthen once more. I could hear rain begin to pound on the roof of the small hut. The walls creaked as they were moved. Riley stirred yet again, suddenly more alert. What's happening? Where's the blade? He began to sit up and then screamed out in pain, falling back on the bed. Gareth, I have to get out of here. 
Afraid I can't do that, brother, Gareth told him, pacing the room in thought. They've never come this far inland, other than river, of course. Oh, I don't like this. But they'll find us soon enough. As if on cue, the door was kicked open. A towering drifter barged his way in, claws tearing at the doorframe. He screamed at the sight of them, bringing more heavy rain onto the hut. Back away, Gareth, I whispered, moving my hand down to the blade still sheathed at my side. He dove aside, leaving a straight path. I had to make sure I was on target, even with my crippled eyesight. I drew the blade slowly, leaning forward and focusing on the diaphragm area, just like Raleigh had showed me that day on the beach. It ran forward, rushing at me with arms held wide, claws brandished. I lunged forward, stabbing up toward it. I missed. It screamed in pain as the blade struck in the middle of the ribcage, above the diaphragm. I heard the bone crack as it was cleaved in two. The drifter fell on top of me, teeth gnashing as it tried to recover. I moved my other hand to the hilt of the blade, grasping it and starting to soar downward. The drifter threw its head forward, attempting to bite down on my neck as I moved to the side under it, furiously working the blade lower. I heard the final gasp as I hit my target. The drifter collapsed, twitching. Gareth ran forward to help roll it off me as I pulled the blade free, spattering blue blood on the walls. Well, are you okay? Riley asked sitting up slowly this time so as to not hurt himself. He still winced in pain. Raleigh, thank God, I said, moving over to him. Look, I found how we can stop this. We have to get River. I grabbed the book from the nearby table, flipping to the poem. I shoved it toward Raleigh to read. Brothers of Red and Blue. That can't mean us, can it? He asked, looking up at me. I think so. I said. I could see the fear in his face. He was putting all this together, the same puzzle I'd pieced together just hours ago. The wind was constant now, a continuous roar, a monster tearing the island apart. A board was torn off the roof, leaving an opening for rain to begin pouring through. Help me up, Gareth, Raleigh said, swinging his legs over the side of the bed. We need to get my brother. I hefted the blade, getting ready to make our run across the square. Gareth stood, holding Raleigh up on his shoulders. We exchanged a small nod before running out of the hut and into the chaos. The square was bathed in red. Drifters were dragging bodies out of homes, taking no care if they cut them open or not. Anyone that resisted was torn open, treated as a game by the attacking monsters. I could see one in the distance, grabbing a woman away from her screaming wife, slashing her throat so blood covered the woman she loved. It let out a demented laugh before lunging at the other woman. We made our way through, dodging what we could and trying to cut through what we couldn't. We finally reached the door of Briggs' office, busting it in and charging through. River sat there in the center of the room, staring toward us. A smile playing behind the gag over his mouth. Grab and run, I said, looking towards Gareth and Raleigh. I took hold of the chair River was in and began dragging it out into the storm. We tried to go around the perimeter of the square and toward the path of the beach so as not to be seen. A drifter chased someone out into our path, stopping as it saw us. I charged forward, stabbing it through the eye this time. It fell to the ground shrieking, causing the storm to strengthen. When we finally made it to the path, I saw that we didn't have far to go. The amount of drifters congregating in the island and the chaos they were bringing caused a storm surge, bringing waves just a few hundred yards away. The dunes were gone. Now the island just consisted of the square and the surrounding area. Oh, it's time, brother, River shouted over the chaos. I looked back to see he'd chewed through the gag, allowing him to talk once more. There is our God waiting just as promised. 
I looked in the distance to see an inky silhouette on the horizon, moving ever closer to our position. With every stride it sent a towering wave toward us, taking more of the land for its own. Drifters were frothing in the waves, moving closer to the square. There had to be hundreds, all crashing on top of each other as they scrambled to be the first to the feeding. They stopped as they saw us. Set me down, Raleigh said. Gareth gave him a look to confirm what he was asking, then a small nod before setting him to his feet. Raleigh came over to me then, putting his hands on my shoulders. Whatever happens, I want you to know how proud I am, he said. He deftly slipped the blade away from me, hiding it in his coat pocket. Well, brother, does your offer still stand? Will you take me to the sea? I thought you would never ask, River smiled, showing his sharp teeth. Raleigh walked over to him, holding his knife to the rope ensnaring him. I will set you free, but you must promise me you will not harm them. Raleigh was wheezing with the effort of standing on his own. River simply nodded in return. With a quick flick of the knife, his restraints fell around him. They walked together toward the water, River shouting to the other drifters in victory. When they were waist deep, he turned to Raleigh. Behold, Panther Lassin. He motioned to the giant figure, features still obscured by the wind and rain that seemed to emanate from it. The great sea, ruler of all beneath the waves, I bring you a sacrifice, the last of the cleansing line. He turned to face Raleigh, looking at him as he did the same. I've waited so long, Riley. He thrust his hand forward, impaling Riley through the heart. He let out a gasp, leaning forward on his brother. River took him in a great hug, bringing him close. Riley wrapped his arms around him in return. I, as well, I heard him say. He flipped the blade from his pocket and held it to River's back hugging him tight with one arm before thrusting towards himself. River let out a noise of surprise as he and Raleigh were joined by the blade. The drifters standing around began to scream and writhe, causing the wind to rise with them. And suddenly, they stopped. Gareth grabbed my arm and pulled me back, away from the water as we watched. The two brothers, their blood mixing on the blade and running into the water, seemed to melt away into a pool of red and blue. It only took moments for them to disappear completely, the colour in the water branching out further toward the crowd of drifters. When they were touched by the blood, the drifters turned to water. With each new mass, a rising wave was formed, holding its place as a wall of water at the shoreline. I could almost make out the two brothers in the middle of it, still locked in their death embrace, translucent in their new state of being. When all the drifters had been reached, it was a towering tsunami standing at the ready. Panther Lassin stood in the distance, the storm still swirling around him. He hefted his fist, crashing it down into the water and sending his own wave forward. The great tsunami rushed to meet it, absorbing it as they collided picked up speed as it moved ever closer to the sea god, rolling with fury. There was a loud crash as it smashed into the giant, knocking him from his feet. I saw it try to get back up again and regain its footing, but as it did, tendrils of water shot forward from the surface, ensnaring him at every possible point. Finally two tendrils, one red and one blue, shot forward to wrap around the ancient neck of the sea pulling it first to its knees, and then under the surface forever. We've started taking count and burying our dead now. The island is destroyed. Houses gone completely. It appeared as though we'd suffered a direct hit from a hurricane. I was walking along the beach earlier when I spotted something shining in a tide pool. 
As I ran forward to look, I was able to make out the hilt of the time blade. The blade itself was broken. Nothing but jagged splinters after a few inches, but I kept it anyway. It's hard to remember the father I only had for a short time. The man who gave his life for us as long as he lived. I know when the waves crash in, it's him telling me that he's still there, keeping the evil at bay in death as he did in life. Thank you, Riley. Well, that really was a treat for this beautiful, beautiful Sunday evening, wasn't it? Fantastic story there from Googly Eyes 93, also known as Ross Tyson. Many thanks to him for letting me read that one. Um, links to his various places online in the video description. So please do me a favor, go check him out, give him some love. You know the score. So um, those of you that follow me on Patreon and give me your dearly, dearly um, loved support, will see that I put the first part of that story on there earlier today. Just a bit of an experiment to um, see how you liked it. Now, of course, um, I don't want any of you who follow me on this channel to suffer any kind of financial hardship by trying to um, support me financially. But if you want to throw me a dollar or two here or there, it would be very, very much appreciated. I'm doing this full time now, so it's my living. So I make a living. And I know a lot of you um, do like to support me, but if you haven't got any money, do not give it to me. Anything you can't spare, okay? Well, my dear friends, that's it for Sunday evening. I'll be back again tomorrow. Oh, Monday again already. These weeks are really flying by, aren't they? Well, enough of my waffling. Very, very sweet dreams. And bye-bye.